Hello. We just wanted to give a couple of minutes to allow folks to get into the room, but I do want to get us started. And I appreciate you all staying after school if you're still at your school instead of at home watching us this afternoon to join us. Um, I'm Andrea Lewis. I'm Director of Programs at Maryland Humanities, so welcome. We're really glad you could join us. And I do want to start by asking if you could take a moment to drop the name of your school and the county you're in in the chat, if you're able to do that. That would be great. We'd love to get a sense of where you're joining us from. Just some quick housekeeping items before we begin. We are recording this event and I hope to make it available um, to you within the next week or so. It'll, a link will come out by email uh, so that you can uh, watch it with other students or teachers who couldn't join us this afternoon. And so look for that uh, sometime later this week or next week if you would like to have access to today's video. If you have a question for Ross Gay, we're gonna ask that you use the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Please try to remember not to drop questions in the chat because we don't wanna miss them. With the Q&A function, you're able to view the questions that other attendees have asked. And if you wanna ask a question someone else has already put in the Q&A, you're gonna click the thumbs up under it to upvote that question. And that way we'll know which of the questions are of the most interest to you when we get to the audience Q&A later in the program. Uh, we've also enabled the captions, which you should see at the bottom of the screen. If those captions um, are distracting to you rather than helpful, look for the button that says CC for closed captioning and you should be able to turn them off. Or if you have updated uh, your, your Zoom software recently, you would find that under the button that says more and you should be able to turn those off. Okay. This event is one of more than 300 programs being held this fall as part of our One Maryland, One Book program, which we like to think of as Maryland's biggest book club. Like you, students and teachers across the state are reading the Book of Delights for class or in a school book club. And I hope that you are enjoying the book uh, as much as I did. At Maryland Humanities, we're passionate about making the humanities part of everyday life. Programs like this one use the humanities to explore our ideas, our stories, and our values. To foster understanding among people with diverse perspectives and to strengthen our ability to interact meaningfully. And if you're interested, you can learn more about we, what we do at mdhumanities.org. And for some of you, you may be familiar with Maryland Humanities through one of our other programs uh, for students, Maryland History Day. We're on social media and we'd love it if you share your experience today or what you, what you think about the book as you're reading it, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I'm gonna drop the hashtag for you. Bear with me for just a minute. It's 1MD1BK, but we use the numbers. So that's the hashtag there. Uh, if you decide that you wanna share some feedback with us as you read the book. So now I'd like to introduce our guest for this afternoon, Ross Gay. What we're gonna do is Ross is gonna read from the Book of Delights and I'll ask him a few questions, but we'd really like to know what your questions are. Um, so if I see a lot of questions coming through in the chat, I'll keep my questions to a minimum and we will get to yours. So let me give you an introduction for Ross and then we'll get down to it. Ross Gay is the author of the Book of Delights, a genre-defined book of essays, and four books of poetry, including his most recent, Beholding, a love song to legendary basketball player Julius Irving, known as Dr. J, who dominated the courts in the 1970s and 80s as a small forward for the Philadelphia 76ers. Gay is the founding editor with Carissa Chen and Patrick Rosal, of the online sports magazine, Some Call It Ballin'. 
a founding board member of the Bloomington Community Orchard, a nonprofit free fruit for all food justice and joy project. Gay has received fellowships from Cave Canem, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Guggenheim Foundation. She teaches at Indiana University. In the Book of Delights, Gay offers up a volume of lyric essays written over one tumultuous year. The first nonfiction book from the award-winning poet is a record of the small joys we often overlook in our busy lives. But Gay never dismisses the complexities, even the terrors, of living in America as a Black man or the ecological and psychic violence of our consumer culture or the loss of those he loves. More than any other subject, though, Gay celebrates the beauty of the natural world. So I'm going to turn things over to Ross. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much. Again, it's good to um, it's good to be with you all. Um, for some reason, I feel inclined to keep being like this is the this is the fourth. This is maybe the fifth event that we're doing. Maybe the fourth. Maybe the fifth. Um, anyway, and it's just fun. And one of the things I'm trying to do is um, for those of you who don't know, this is a, a book. The Book of Delights is a book of essays that I wrote um, from August 1st of 2016 to August 1st of 2017. And I basically was just one day I was um, having like a moment of delight and I thought, oh, I should write a little essay. I should write about that. I should write a little essay about that. And then immediately something came in my head and said, which I'd like to say a bird, um, but maybe it was like an elephant, flew into my head and was like, do it for a year, write an essay every day for a year about something that delighted you. So that's what this book is. And that's what I did. And I gave myself three rules. The rules were to do it every day, to write them by hand. I have some ideas about that. And to write them quickly. So I only, I only, I drafted them all. I wrote the first draft of them in 30 minutes, never going over that. And, and if that comes out, we can talk more about that. So there's, I didn't write them every single day. I'm not quite that guy actually, but I wrote a lot of them. And it turns out there's 102 in the book. We finally got down to 102. Um, so today I've, or this, this week, I've been trying to read ones that I don't read all the time and just kind of dropping into certain places and reading kind of through. Today, I'm gonna to read this. I'm gonna start off with this one called Transplanting. And then, um, and then I'm gonna to move to a, a little suite of other ones. Transplanting, for those of you know, don't know, um, is like putting a plant, you know, moving a plant from one place to another or taking a little part of a plant and putting it someplace else. That's called transplanting. Today I have smuggled three and figs, figs, figs. Um, I love figs, fresh figs. Um, and I do my best to try to like figure out how to grow them. I, I've only lived in the North and it takes a little thinking, but there's plenty of people who know how to do it. And I refer to one of them in this essay. Today, I have smuggled three fig cuttings onto a flight from Philadelphia to Detroit. Truth be told, no smuggling has occurred, given as I was carrying the things open and notorious, their roots tucked into some moist compost in a plastic bag. But smuggling makes it sound more thrilling than what it appears carrying a few sticks in a bag, and therefore more like what it is, carrying living creatures for replanting about 700 miles away, which you might've already gone there, given as I've told you already their figs, is another way of saying I'm carrying joy around in my bag. Actually, right now they're in the overhead compartment in that plastic bag, probably a little funky with my dirty clothes. This is one of those delights that keeps piling up as the fig tree I took these cuttings from in Stephanie's mother's backyard in Frenchtown, New Jersey, was itself made from a cutting from a grove of figs further down the Delaware in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, where my friend Jay's family lived and where his father grew a wonderful garden, including bitter melon, Asian pears, peaches, ang choy, and yes, these figs. When I first asked if I could transplant some of Mr. Lau's figs, he was moving and I was heartbroken that that garden would no longer be a sanctuary to me. He said, yes, if he even said that, 
walked me out to the grove of figs beneath his massive chestnut tree, grabbed a pickaxe, and started hacking. I was kind of terrified, green, green thumb that I was. Two ancillary delights. Mr. Lau, old school, OG, actually got a turtle, drilled a hole in its shell, tied a string to a nut about the hole size, which he then dropped into that hole in the turtle, tying the other end of the string to a stick in the middle of his lettuces so that he could have a steady, if coerced, slug patrol. That's not the delight. The delight is that his son, my pal Jay, carried the under cover of night, dislodged the nut from the shell, carried the critter on his bike, one-handed, no helmet, to a nearby tributary of Neshaminy Creek, the critter's River Jordan. Ancillary delight too, with a twinge of irony. When people say they have a black thumb, meaning they can't grow anything, I say, yeah, me too. And then I talk about the abundant garden these black thumbs are growing. Then we stuck the cuttings in a bucket full of water, and he did, in fact, tell me not to let them grow out. Yes, not to let them dry out. Yesterday, when I dug up a few of Stephanie's mother's figs, I used a shovel and hacked at the roots like Mr. Lau, though I was sending soothing mind beams to the tree as I did so. After I got a few well-rooted cuttings, I took them to the bucket near the hose, filled it up, dropped them in, showered and dressed for the funeral of a beloved 20-year-old kid named Rachel who fell to her death a few nights ago. While Stephanie was telling me over the phone about Rachel's death, she said two butterflies alighted on the butterfly bush we had just planted. When we were standing in the back corner of the funeral home during the eulogies, I moved there because I'm tall and I called Stephanie over so we could listen together. Stephanie caught sight of a silver gleam on the gray carpet. When the eulogy was over, she picked it up, a single elephant earring. Elephants were Rachel's favorite animal. She adored them. When we got home after the pizza and guacamole, my guacamole, a delight, another delight. Here's the recipe. Avocado, onion, garlic, salt, that's it. I grabbed the bucket, trimmed the cuttings into sticks, potted them in the plastic bag and set them on the counter where they sat like promises, little converters, little dreamers of coming back into bloom and how we might carry that with us wherever we go. Um, this one is called Get Thee to the Nutrient Cycle. <laughs> this morning, I was peeing into an empty rice wine vinegar bottle, which makes, with some olive oil, the vinegar, the vinegar, my very favorite salad dressing. I was peeing into the bottle so that I could discreetly pour it into my watering can to give my garden plants a shot of nitrogen, which the pea has in abundance. It's a fun exercise, the version that involves a penis anyway, which I'm most familiar with, because depending on the receptacle, which I so badly want to call a vessel, it can be a bit of an ordeal. For instance, without telling you much, I can tell you that the vinegar bottle requires something like putting one's key to a eye to a keyhole, except if you do it wrong, you will pee on your hands and the floor. I go in and out of collecting my urine for my garden and was reminded of the bounty our bodies produce. In other words, our forgotten station in the nutrient cycle. I wonder if this simple forgetting, this collective amnesia that we are in fact, part of the nutrient cycle is the source of our gravest problem, namely that we're in the long process of making our planet uninhabitable to many species, including ourselves. I was reminded of this upon running into my friend Jack on 4th Street. Jack, along with a bevy of other skills, is a superb dumpster diver. Talking about the waste stream segued easily, easily into a conversation about the garden 
and peen in it. Jack mentioned that his droopy plants perk right up with a shot of his PT. Though Jack feeds with a stronger solution, three to five parts of P to 10 parts water than I prefer. One to two parts P to 10 parts water. Oh yeah, I thought, I gotta get back on that. Now that I think of it, I stopped harvesting PT a few years back when I was living for the year with Stephanie and her family in New Jersey. We were sharing a community garden plot for which I had been collecting my pea, a fact I bet the other gardeners would not have left. All the same, I was diligent. And one day after a solo basketball workout on the crummy courts behind the Milford Public Library, I harvested into an empty Gatorade bottle, filling it up all the way with the warm golden elixir, capping it tight and putting it in the cup holder before going to pick up Stephanie's daughter, Georgia from softball practice or camp or something. We were chatting and driving down Route 29 when I watched her spot the bottle, grab it, twist it open, and moving it toward her mouth, ask if she could have a sip. Friends, you may know that fully one third of being an adult man in a girl's life is not to be perceived as, not to be a pervert, both of which boundaries I was very close to unintentionally crossing simply by virtue of this child's cavalier disregard for my boundaries, which is my way of saying, I am the one who needs your sympathy right now. In the single most athletic gesture of my adult life, I removed the full and sort of warm vessel from Georgia's hand without spilling even a drop, recapped it and placed it back in the cup holder without driving off the road saying, you better not. Had I been more prepared, I would have said something about a cold or something, but instead we just drove the few miles home in weird, perverse silence. This is called pulling carrots. Today we pulled the carrots from the garden that Stephanie sowed back in March. She planted two kinds, a red kind shaped like a standard kind and a squat orange kind with a French name, a kind I recall the packet calling a market variety, probably because like the red kind, it's an eye catcher and sweet, which I learned nibbling a couple of both kinds like Bugs Bunny as I pulled them. The word kind, meaning type or variety, which you have noticed I have used with some flourish is among the delights for it puts the kindness of carrots front and center in this discussion, good for your eyes, yummy, et cetera. In addition to reminding us that kindness and kin have the same mother, maybe making those to whom we are kind our kin, to whom even those we might be. And that circle is big. These are kinds I'm thinking as I snip the feathery green tops, making my way through the pile, holding the root in one hand, feeling the knobs and grains, the divots where they've grown against a rock or some critter nibbled, or the four or five of the red kind that have become almost two carrots, carrot legs in need of some petite pantaloons. The utterly forgettable magic of the carrot, which applies as well to the turnip and radish and potato and garlic and onion, and ginger and turmeric and yam and sancho and shallot and salsify and maca and sweet potato and more, is that because much of the food resides under the ground, it probably had to be discovered, uncovered. And after the discovering and the uncovering, choosing which ones to replant and replant and replant and replant and replant, and replant, and replant, until there was the long red kind I'm brushing the soil from, until the squat kind piling up at the bottom of the basket. It was kindness. They are our family. It's called filling the frame. I finally watched the movie Moonlight and perhaps the most moving parts of the movie to me were the scenes of kids, mostly black kids, at play. 
I'm thinking, of course, of the dance classroom where the uniformed children all practice their own moves, studying their beautiful bodies in the mirror. Little Chiron going hard, twirling and getting his shoulders into it. And when playing Kill the Man, which they played with a torn up soccer ball, they sprinted through the dusty field chasing each other or being chased, trying to put their hands on each other, to em embrace each other and roll with each other and smell each other in that sanctioned way, laughing and shouting through the field, laying on each other, holding each other beneath the sun, feeling the frame. This one's called reckless air quotes, air quotes. I have a new friend who uses or misuses air quotes with such abundance and a plum that it's actually a demolishment of the gesture, a blessed desecration. You can't help but notice that his air quotes are not even in the same gestural family as those you might see at lectures or public readings, half embarrassed one digit swipes at the air or distracted waves or half-hearted peace signs or very, very half-hearted, quarter-hearted victory signs. My friend's air quotes are unabashed, two-handed, two-fingered, punctuative dances, during which often he will lean back or put a hip out like he's setting a hula hoop in motion. Sometimes he flares his elbows as though he's boxing out. Although the entirety of his air quote rumba delights me, I am most delighted by the fact that he does the dance infrequently to indicate attribution, that someone or a someone might say or have said a thing. Indeed, the only physiolinguistic significance of the gesture seems to be maybe emphasis, a kind of italics, though it's hard to say. This one is called um, the Marfa Lights. The Marfa Lights. Marfa is a town in um, Texas and um, there's a place called the Lannan Foundation, and they have they offer residencies to writers, maybe other artists too, but definitely to writers, where you can go there and they put you up for a month. Um, so I was there with my friend um, Patrick Rosal, who shows up in this book a few times, um, several times probably. Um, but we were there just working on our various projects, and this this happened when we were down there. The Marfa Lights. And the Marfa Lights, just so you know, the Marfa Lights in, in down in Marfa in Texas, down where this is, it, um, there are evidently these um, kind of strange uh, occurrences that happen in the sky that they call the Marfa Lights. Uh, I didn't see them when I was there, but I've heard about them. My buddy Pat and I went to shoot around at the basketball courts here in Marfa today. We were warming up, shooting 12 footers or doing slow spin moves or crossovers. When a young guy from the other side of the court swaggered toward us, holding a ball on his hip, the light gleaming in his earring, and challenged us to a two-on-two, -two, pointing his thumb to himself and to his buddy back in the corner, draining threes. We agreed and went on to kick the shit out of them, 21 to nothing. That is a horrible figure of speech. And I leave it in only to expose the violence we so easily say. We got more baskets than they did that they were only 12 years old is irrelevant, given as this was their home court. And they even had a crowd watching. Another little girl who, when one, when one of the kids shouted to the gods, they're kicking our butts, she said, I hope so. They're grown men. Um, this next one is called scat. Um, and you know, scat's another word for uh, dookie. And um, this is a garden, kind of a garden uh, essay. <laughs> I realize this little pocket of these essays, sometimes they have things to do with, you know, bathroom, bathroom subjects, but there's other essays too. Scat, cleaning out the shed in the garden today, what remains of my shed, roofless with half of the framing rotted out, I noticed two fingers of black shit bejeweled throughout with mulberry seeds. 
I was so delighted at the turds, delighted at what I figured was one of the neighborhood deer hunkering down in my not quite shed beneath the starry night to gobble mulberries dropped from the tree above, that I snagged a thick leaf from the pokeweed plant growing in my not quite shed and scooped the less coiled of the nuggets for further inspection, for further delighting upon. I was going to write a delight about the turd, I'm saying, with some kind of moral, I'm sure, about finding delight, delight even in Dookie. The first clue that I am a novice naturalist, some of you are already noting it, is that deer scat is not loggish or fingerish. It is pelletish. Once I remembered that, walking toward the tomato beds I was weeding, I tossed the turd to the ground, nervous it might be raccoon shit. I was trying to remember if raccoons were among the more avid transporters of rabies, and if that might fester in dookie, and if so, if it might permeate my skin, and if so, if it might leave me writhing and foaming at the mouth beneath the blueberries, so different from the romantic way I sometimes imagine keeling over in my garden. Looking at the late day light gleaming in the seeds, in the shit, my tiny reflection winking and every one of them. I remember Galway Cannell's poem, The Bear, in which the speaker tracking a bear he's tricked into eating a blade whittled of a wolf's rib, eats some of its bloody scat. He calls it a turd. It is a bafflement that people, myself included, did not immediately consider the poem goofy or silly or ridiculous or even at very least scatological. It somehow managed to elevate itself into the mythic, the profound. You can imagine the 20 something boys in a poetry circle jerk reading that poem, none of them cracking the least smile, so immersed in the presence of transcendent knowledge were they. My friend Dave lifted the veil for me, showed me the poem was serious and goofy, which doesn't in the least diminish my love for many of Cannell's poems, a couple of which I have kind of plagiarized. <laughs> Anyhow, it often delights me when a grave thing is revealed to be also kind of silly. The first thing, the first time I saw The Exorcist, I was nine years old. My mom, flipping through the TV guide, saw that it was coming on HBO. And she wanted to see it because my dad, a very reasonable man, asked her to hold off when it first came out. She was pregnant with my brother and people watching the movie were having miscarriages and heart attacks in the theater, both of which used to be evidence of a good movie. In 20 minutes or so, when little Linda Blair disrupts the, the socialite party by peeing on the rug in her white nightgown, I was very frightened. And I asked my mother if we might watch Falcon Crest instead. It's a rerun, she said. Just go to bed if you don't want to watch it. <laughs> Dear reader, I'm here going to leap a boundary I shouldn't, like some of your childless ex-friends before me, to tell you how to raise your children. My brother's and my bedroom was maybe 20 feet from this television. It was maybe three or four seconds by foot away. But my imagination was vast, by which I mean to tell you not to watch The Exorcist with your children or The Shining, or Rosemary's goddamn baby. Damn right, I was already too scared to do anything by myself. And when little Linda Blair was stabbing herself with a crucifix and vomiting in the faces of priests, I was doomed. I sat on the couch pretending to read our newspaper, the Bucks County Courier Times, as I heard the girl about my age panting and growling. I peeked beneath the business section to see little Linda Blair write from inside of her Lucifer ravaged tummy, H E L P. Of course, my dad, the one person in the world who could for sure beat up evil, was down working at Roy Rogers on Cotman, slinging hamburgers. When I did finally go to bed, I sobbed, certain I too would be possessed by Satan which my brother did not go the extra mile to discourage me from thinking. Me, Matt, am I possessed? Matt, I don't know, me. 
are you sure? Am I possessed? <laughs> I, I messed that up. Let me go back. <laughs> me, Matt, am I going to be possessed? Matt, I don't know. Me, am I possessed? Matt, pulling the covers over his head. I don't know, maybe. For the record, my mother now knows this was an instance of heroically poor parenting, in part because I rub her face in it often. She puts her forehead in her hand and shakes her head while I bask in her shame. When I mustered up the courage to see the exorcist again, the redux, I was about 26. I went with my friend Joanna to the theater between 18th and 19th on Chestnut, in Philadelphia. When Linda Blair peed on the rug this time, someone said to the screen, oh no, she didn't. And when her head spun around, someone yelled, that girl's tripping. At which point I realized this movie which had occupied for years a grave space in my imagination, was actually silly. I was freed from the grave, or rather, I was offered another version of the grave, laughter in its midst. Okay, I will pause there for a minute. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. So we have some good questions coming in. So I'll just ask a few to get us started. Um, you know, we were talking beforehand, there are so many details of these essays that I found I connected with. And yet, when I sit here now, I tend to think a lot of, about the through lines, right, from essay to essay and what I saw. And the thing that immediately comes to mind for me, even with the title being the Book of Delights, is gratitude. Yeah. Gratitude runs throughout these essays in different ways. And, you know, there, it's been a rough 19 months in so many ways for people with so much happening on top of what we're already navigating. And I know for teachers and students, you know, we, um, they have really worked through a lot to yeah. try to keep their education going. So I'm wondering if, did, did you actually recognize um, as, as you were writing these essays that they were in many ways about gratitude? Um, and did you, if you, whether or not you did or didn't, did, do you feel sitting here now that having written these essays, you learned anything about gratitude, about how you view it or how you recognize it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the, like, it's funny, it took me a while to, to realize that, you know, so the book before the Book of Delights, my third book, it's a book of poems called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. And, you know, that book is give you know sort of gave me the opportunity to be thinking about this idea of gratitude um, a lot and but when I started writing the book of delights um, I wasn't thinking of I wasn't thinking explicitly of gratitude I was I think I was thinking of um, what would happen if this practice of noting what it is that brings a person to light what would happen if you do this every day I was just so that was just the kind of the curiosity that it, that compelled me to write it. Um, but it was after the fact that someone actually mentioned something along the lines of like, oh, this, this noting of delight is a kind of gratitude practice. And, and then I thought about, and I thought, of course, you know, one of the things that this book does is it, um, it trains us to, um, note and think about what it is that we love. You know, that's how I think of it. I think of it, it's like, you know, note what you love, you know, notice what you love, think about meditate on what you love and share what you love, you know, share what you love. And, you know, when you're spending time noting what you love, there's another word for that, you know? And, and, and also I think if you're noting what you love and that and the ways that you might share what you love, I think another word for that is gratitude. It's precisely that, you know? Um, you know, if you're, if you love, if you note that you love, um, um, 
you know, the, whatever, the high five from strangers, or you note the way that you love what your mother's face looks like when she laughs a little bit embarrassed, you know, if you note that you love, you know, this food that your friend drops off at your porch, you know, when you note it, oh, I love this, oh, I love this, and I love that, and I love this, and I love that, and I love this, and I love that, you're actually sort of cataloging your gratitude, you know, I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's very true. Yeah. Um, since I mentioned current times, something that has very much bubbled to the surface over the past year, and by your fifth essay, Hole in the Head, you're, you are reflecting on racism mm -hmm. in this country, in your memory, right, as we go throughout the essays. And it, I, I wonder if there is anything you can share, given that this is a book about delights. Um, did you really consider or think about as you were writing how you might reconcile um, a heavier topic like racism and how um, from your perspective as a black man, you walk through this life being very aware of it and how you need to navigate uh, this world. Your father reminds you of the ways in which you need to think about navigating this world. Did, did that, did you, were you thinking about that at all as you included the essays on that topic versus, you know, the praying mantis or yeah. the flowers or your garden? Yeah. Um, I think very early on, I realized that part of what I was going to need to do for this book to remain interesting and honest to me was to be like, was to encounter the fullness of my life, you know, so the fullness of my life included, you know, all, you know, racism and, um, heartbreak and, you know, um, environmental degradation and on and on and on and on. And, and it was funny, like even reading that essay, which is sort of ridiculous, the essay about peeing into a, a a jar and you know this and that um it's also there's that moment in the essay where i'm sort of like i'm doing a meditation on what it means for us not to realize that we're part of the nutrient cycle like what is the brutality that can come out of that to not which is basically a way in my head of saying not not to recognize a kind of gratitude that we are in fact in the same kind of process as the trees and as the birds and as the worms that we are part of that cycle um, and that to sort of negate that or to alienate ourselves from that itself is sort of um, itself is a kind of brutality and then brutality inviting um, theory, I would say, which of course I'm trying also to be like, you know, that's why I pee in the garden, <laughs> you know, but, but, the, but the point being that, you know, I thought for the book to be interesting to me, it was going to have to um, engage with the things that I'm thinking about. Um, in my daily life and meditating on in my daily life. Um, if it were just a book of things that like, were, were like glad, you know, the book of glad, gladnesses, <laughs> I wouldn't be interested in it, you know? I'm interested in delight in a way because it's sort of like, what I think is interesting is delight despite, you know? Like we all have, you know, we're all trained in this by people who love us to know how to, um, witness what is remarkable in the midst of our sorrows. You know, we, we all know people who can do that. And, um, you know, that that's just like, you know, that's one of the ways we, we keep going, I think. Yeah. Switching gears a little bit, I'm wondering, um, do you think age influences what we find delightful? So what we find delightful when we're kids versus teens versus young adults and then as we age? I totally think so. I totally think so. That would be a good thing to kind of like almost survey a little bit, you know, to kind of get a feeling of like, yeah, what do like people, you know, 15 to 25, what do, or whatever, little kids. Because one of the things about the light, and this is a thing that I feel like I'm learning is that curiosity is necessary for the light. Like the light and curiosity are hand in hand, which is also to say that the light and like surprise or delight in not knowing something go hand in hand. And the least delighted um, people, 
in my experience. And I'll say myself, I'm the least delighted when I know everything, you know, when I know the answers to everything, when I got it down, I'm undelightable, you know, and <laughs> which is the wrong thing to be as far as I'm concerned, you know, but when I, when I am sort of open to surprise or open to like, you know, able to witness not only that, you know, there's like a thick, like a three or four bunnies over there that, that also there's like, you know, <laughs> I don't know, the way that the light comes through them or the way that they seem kind of to be like circling around together, like they're doing a dance or something like, you know, that, that sort of capacity to not, to be like, what the hell is going on is very much, as far as I'm concerned, connected to the light. And the people who automatically are like that are little, little people, are children. You know, kids are always like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> you know, and it's it's part of the reason they can't they can't get anywhere. <laughs> you know, like you watch a little kid going, you know, going, going somewhere. I don't have kids, but I have the pleasure of being around kids and being around them enough to know this and to watch them delightedly. It's like everything is is like, good lord, what is this? You know, this piece of gum on the sidewalk, are you kidding me? That was in someone's mouth. And now it's on the ground. <laughs> and now it's on my shoe. This is astonishing, you know? And in a way, it's sort of like, you know, obviously it's sort of the fullness of the, ch of the child's emotion is, is, is wonderful. And it's probably like also why the child could be like, that's impossible. How could that possibly happen? Like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, un it's unbelievable. I know. Now you got gum on your shoe. I know. It's amazing. And it's also a bummer. Um, but, to have that kind of, you know, energy and that kind of um, experience. You know, my friend uh, has a beautiful, Amy Nezukumatazo has a beautiful book called World of Wonders. Um, and she often talks about kids don't have to be taught to be full of wonder. They just walk around full of wonder, you know? And um, in a way, I think the light has some very tight relationship to, um, to wonder, which also has a tight relationship to, being surprised and not knowing, being curious. And so anyway, that's a long way of sort of meditating on the fact that I think kids are kind of our teachers in this. You know, kids are our teachers in this, like how to be flummoxed with, with beauty, flummoxed, you know, constantly flummoxed. Like, I can't believe, I can't believe what the light looks like through the trees, you know, when you look at it like that, I can't believe it, you know. That's great. So I have one final question to you sort of as a bridge to the audience questions, because we've got some great questions that have come in. Um, when did you know you wanted to be a writer? Yeah. I know that's a fairly common question for writers, yeah. but I'm realizing we spent hours with you already this week. And, you know, unless I was, was busy helping out responding in the chat for another event, I don't think I've heard you talk about when you knew. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, I got turned on in a real way to writing in, um, excuse me, I think it was my second year of college. Yeah, it was my second year of college. This is the way, this is how I recall it. My second year of college, I was a football, I played football in college. I was um, like a scholarship athlete. I wasn't into school at, at all. Like, you know, as a kid, I was, I was into school for social reasons and for football and basketball, but I wasn't. I wasn't about, I wasn't about class, you know. I was about being in class just to disrupt class, actually. That's all I wanted to do or do something else. Like when I think we did so much, like me, I think one of my buddies who shows up in the essay about um, the figs in here that I read, my buddy Jay, um, who's a doctor now, he's an ER doctor, but we, we spent a lot of time like, you know, messing around in class in ways that now I realize, oh, Oh, we were practicing. I mean, I, I was practicing for what I'm doing right now, you know, we because it was creative play. We were messing around and being so creative um, in ways that I, I kind of aspire to. I'm like, man, those kids knew what to do, you know. But I, in college, I, um, I was in a literature class in my second year, and I was close to losing my funding. And I had a teacher named David Johnson, um, Professor Johnson, who has asked me, it was a survey of American literature, and he asked me to give a presentation on a poet named Amiri Baraka. Um, and um, 
I read Baraka's work and I think more than anything I had ever read, um, cause I didn't really read books as a kid. I wasn't, I wasn't a big reader. I read comic books um, as, in middle school, I read comic books, but I read Baraka's work and I just, I just um, was completely changed. And at that point I was so moved by his work and this poem called An Agony As Now is one that I just, poured over and continued to be so moved by, I, I, um, I started wanting to do that. I wanted to do what he did, you know? And then, so I started reading very hard, very seriously and thinking hard about, you know, that step. I also, at the same time, I became involved with people. Um, people came into my life who were also thinking about making art, making theater, you know, you know, making music and stuff. So I was kind of in this in a in a community at the same time and but i really think that's one of the things i had a teacher who showed me something he i had a teacher who loved something and thought i might love it too you know and showed it to me and it was it was right i loved it and it changed my life you know it changed my life that's great so um i i made that my last question because there are of course a number of questions about your writing and I'm gonna ask the audience for a little bit of grace because there are a number of questions in the Q&A that are similar, wanting to know um, uh, about your writing. Um, and I'm gonna start with, not with what you're writing next, although that's in here, <laughs> and will there be more delights? Um, but can you talk a little bit about the editing of these, you know, you've got the editings, um, the editing of the essays, but also how how things actually made it into the book yeah. once you had had written your your essays for the full year. Yeah, great question. I was um, so also to to answer a question that um, I am writing another book of delights right now. Um, I. I started it just like two months on my birthday, August 1st. Um, it's been five years since I wrote that last book, um, since I started the last book. So I thought, oh, let me just try to do this every five years. Let's see what happens. Um, but I, I, so that's one thing I'm working on. I'm working on a few things. But another thing, but, but so what I did, I wrote these things by hand. I think this is interesting for teachers. I, I always wrote them by hand. And partly I do that. And I have a little essay in here talking about it because I think it's the case that we think with our bodies, you know, we really think with our bodies. And so, and writing is thinking. So there's some way, and I can't explain it, you know, more than any kind of feeling way, but there's some way that I feel like when we're thinking with our bodies in different ways, um, whether we're typing on a typewriter, I think that's also a different kind of cognitive bodily experience, but writing by hand, I think um, something else happens. You know, there's other kinds of synapses and other kinds of syntaxes actually that are possible because of that. So I just sort of decided to make that a rule. And then what I would transcribe them into the computer, maybe I'd do it every 15 or 20 essays. Um, I would, um, the first time I transcribed them, I started making them like essays that I recognize. I started cleaning them up, revising them. And I very quickly realized, oh, I'm ruining these things. They're like losing all their, all their heat, you know? And so I waited, I waited to see um, what they needed me to do. And part of the way that I learned what they needed me to do was that I read them out loud at readings and I can kind of hear how they were working, what needed to be changed, what needed to be fixed to, you know, to start the revision process. Because one of the things that I love about writing is revising. I'm like an adamant reviser and if you're an adamant reviser, you kind of sometimes you have to be careful, you know, because you can kind of you can kind of chew up something that's wild and beautiful and unpredictable. You can kind of and chew up. It's funny because really what I mean is like to sh shrink it into shape. Um, and really what what I'm interested in is like kind of you know things that are a little you know wild or something that surprise surprises the writer. And so it can surprise the reader. So eventually I kind of started to learn how to revise them and, and would revise sort of slowly as uh, throughout the year. So I was always kind of revising them a little bit once I kind of learned how, what, how they were kind of trying to work. 
but then what was the process of um, revising the whole book. And I have an editor um, at Algonquin named Amy and um, she was great. And she could raise questions about the essay, see things I didn't see, see repetition, see how often I reference the redbud tree, for instance, one of my favorite trees, the redbud. But she was like, yo, you got a lot of redbud trees in here. Like you might <laughs> have to back it up a little bit. Um, so, you know, then we could kind of start um, pulling essays. We, I probably wrote 275, between 275 and 300 essays. I don't know, something like that. Um, which is to say, I didn't do it every day. Um, we got close, but I didn't do it every day. And, and then we, you know, enough of them were just like, you know, little things that didn't, didn't work at all or were just that you know just weren't gonna weren't gonna turn into anything keepable for a book and then we narrowed it down to about 140 and then from there it was like okay the themes what how can we make themes how can we pull stuff that's um redundant how do we choose if two things or three things are kind of touching on similar subjects how do we how do we either um stagger them in the book so that they no, not staggering them because they're all there. The chronology is how they were written and they were written chronologically and they stayed chronological. How could we select the ones to keep in the book that would not diminish, you know, so that repetition doesn't diminish, but rather um, highlights or elevates, you know? Um, all of these kinds of questions about, you know, when you write this many essays, you have to start thinking, okay, well, how are they working? How are they working together? Are there some that are going to sort of you know, make certain ones unnecessary? Are there some that are make certain ones make more sense and more beautiful and all this kind of stuff? So it was a long process. And then also the process, which is what I'm kind of constantly doing is on the sentence. Like, how do I make these sentences sound as much like the thing that I want them to sound like? Which is the kind of handwritten syntax, the handwritten thinking um, as precise as possible. Can I make it sound like that voice you know which is hard work and like you know to me the funnest thing the funnest thing that's great there i see a question here and and i'm going to add a little to it and hopefully i'm not changing the intent here it says was there a particular delight that was hard to think of or write and i know for me the way i interpreted that you might have seen something that you thought was delightful but then maybe had difficulty writing about it. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, actually, here's here's a really good note on that sort of curiosity thing, too, which is that I, um, I one of the, you know, some of the essays that, that came out were essays where I already knew why a thing delighted me, you know, like I knew the answer already. And when I knew the answer, it wasn't going to be a good essay. I don't think I have a single essay in there that I wrote outside of a kind of like what like outside of being puzzled that became a good essay so i think that actually i was going to say i don't know if that happened i think that happened often i think one of the things that i learned with the course of writing the book is that if i know why a thing is delightful i'm like oh that's delightful i'm going to write about it it's going to be a bad essay because i'm just going to be telling you why something is delightful as opposed to you know okay this was delightful now why was that so delightful then it might has the potential to be what I find to be a good essay, you know? It's a great question. That's great. Yeah. So I'm gonna just do two more uh, because I know that for most folks wrapping up in about an hour is, is gonna be helpful to them. So um, I'm looking here. Do you, is there anything in particular that you hope that readers take away from this book when they, when they get their hands on it? You know, I do, I do feel like there is this, you know, in terms of through lines, I feel like gratitude, but I think one of the through lines of gratitude is actually to share what you love, you know, to know what you love and to share what you love. Like if this, this book is really a book about sharing. You know, um, and it's so often the the delights tend to be witnessing moments of sharing or moments of sort of, you know, almost invisible care, you know, and so that would kind of inspire me delight. But there's also the the mechanics of the book itself is that it's just me being delighted and being like, yo, don't you love this? 
<laughs> you know, so in a way, I feel like that's, that's, that is a kind of ethos to me. Share what you love, you know, share, share what you love. And so I would say that I feel like, you know, I'm not real good at like that kind of, that kind of answer, but I feel like, I feel like I can do that one. That's good. So last question, and thank you everyone for all the questions. I did try to make sure that each person who asked a question had one of their questions shared with Ross. So last one, uh, and I've heard a little bit about the answer to this. You still like your book? Do you ever look back <laughs> and think about wanting to change? Think that there might be something you'd change about it now? Yeah, I love it. I love this book. And um, I change things when I read, I'll change them. You know, like, as I feel like, oh, that sentence could have been a little something like this, or this is a little confusing to hear. Like, I'll change things um, regularly. And I, I, you know, it's fine with me. I don't feel compelled necessarily to change it on the page, like if we have another edition, though, maybe at some point I would. Um, but, but part of what, um, this came up a little bit in a previous, um, one of the previous conversations, and when I finish something, thus far, it's been my experience, more now, the older I get too, more now, I, I, when I finish it, 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 they, my things remain really interesting to me. They stay really interesting. And I think partly because I do really try hard not to write from mastery so that it's not like I'm trying to, I'm trying to knock it out of the park all the time. Really what I'm trying to do is explore something, you know, and let the, the writing that I've done be an artifact of a genuine attempt to explore something, you know? So that then the idea of like goodness or whatever is kind of less relevant. More the, the what is relevant is that, oh, I was, I was trying hard there. I was trying hard, I was really trying there, you know? Like good, good try, good try, Rossi. Uh, so in a way, so that's to say that, yeah, I kind of, I stay interested and, and I encourage, you know, I, I encourage folks who write to try to write in such a way that, or, or relate to their writing maybe is the right way to say it, in such a way that their writing does, even if it becomes something that you wouldn't write or that now, you know, eventually you learn to do other things that you're no longer necessarily wanting to do these previous things, that it is enough of a kind of um, attempt at something that you don't quite know how to do that you look, you can look at it with, you know, generosity and sweetness and be like, oh, you know, that was something, you know. That's great. Ross, thank you so much. And thank you everyone who was able to join us today. Um, you'll notice that in the chat, we dropped a link to our survey. Take a moment and click on it quickly before we close out so that you can provide your feedback. It should only take you about five minutes to complete the survey. I also wanted to mention that if the Book of Delights inspired you to write, you can submit your delight to us and we're gonna highlight it on our website and maybe our social media. And I dropped that link in the chat and you'll wanna make sure you read through. We did um, limit the word count so that uh, these will be quick delights as you know, in the same vein as what Ross has given us through his book, but you'll find all the information through the link. Um, and thank you. That's all I have. I'm glad that you joined us. Thank you, Ross. And you. Um, keep reading and keep sharing your feedback with us about this year's book. Thanks so much. <laughs>